Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Utah League of Cities and Towns COVID-19 Town Hall. It has been a few weeks since we've done a town hall, in part because of our annual convention a couple of weeks ago. But I'm Cameron Dale, the Executive Director of the League, and pleased you're able to join us on short notice for this important town hall about the changes to Utah's COVID-19 strategy that the governor announced a couple of days ago and which go into effect today for individuals and Sunday at midnight for businesses. We will be joined momentarily by uh, Rich Saunders. Uh, he just texted me that he'll be calling in momentarily, as you can imagine, as the director of the health of Utah State Department of Health. Uh, the last couple of days have been sleepless, bouncing from, uh, bouncing from event to event, uh, but he texted and will be on in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, Cliff, I'm sorry that I'm blurry. Hopefully, hopefully that's uh, a computer issue. And although after the year we've had in 2020, I just feel blurry. Rich, good morning. Thank you very much for joining our town hall. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining the town hall. Uh, I was just providing a little bit of background to our mayor's council members and city staffers from around the state. Uh, thank you for joining us for the next half an hour to talk about the change in Utah's strategy to combat COVID-19. For those in attendance, here's the agenda for the next half an hour. I'll let, uh, I'll let Director Saunders give an overview of the major changes that were announced on Tuesday that have gone into effect today. And then I have questions that I've received from league members uh, that I shared with, with Rich last night. We'll walk through some of those questions. If you have additional questions, please put them in the chat room. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, Director Saunders has to leave by 930, uh, but I'll stay on for a few minutes to try to answer questions or at the very least collect additional questions that then we can follow up with Rich and his team about in the hours and days to come. So with that, Director Saunders, I'll turn it over to you to talk about how things have changed this week. Okay. Yeah, there, I was just saying that the main uh, focus of, of this, the, the main shift of this is to place um, the uh, knowledge of the transmission level into local jurisdictions so that people could be more aware of the transmission levels in their local areas and be able to inspire. Our hope is that people will be inspired to um, adjust their behavior in ways that would help uh, slow the spread of the virus in their local areas and to give a little more, um, a, a little less government involvement in, in business practices and, and a, a lot more uh, you know, direction to individuals behavior. We, we have learned through seven months that at this point in time, our greatest weaknesses fall in social gatherings and people thinking that, that somehow maybe the virus won't spread amongst the loved ones because they are all together and they love each other and love being around each other and frankly they're sick of the virus. So they just want to get together and, and have a good time. It, that is what we all should be trying to do. But the main focus of this is to address that particular behavior in hopes that, that we can cause knowledge in the minds uh, of people that that is not necessarily a, a safe way to go about it and, and just plead with them to make some adjustments in their personal behavior. So we have only, a, you know, we only have so many levers we can use to call to respond to this. And one of them is the way we socially interact with each other. Um, the, other uh, the other lever is mask. The other lever is, you know, hygiene and, um, and sanitization. Um, and the other is people staying home if they're sick. And so we, we try to figure out how to incorporate these into policy um, where, where needed, where we feel like we need, but otherwise just public messaging and, and trying to inspire people to make good choices. Eventually, it's going to have to land in the, in the hands of every one of us to just simply be aware of what the transition level is, what the risks are, and how to make decisions on our behavior that, that uh, allow us to keep safe and keep healthy. So that's kind of the main issue, and we wanted to do that 
while protecting businesses and allow them to have a little more, uh, a, a little less government involvement in how, you know, the, the, the particular their behaviors or, or their operations. So we, we wanted to basically say to the business community that they have been doing a really good job generally. There have been outbreaks. There are some businesses that do much by way of helping to support the five. But generally speaking, businesses are very responsible. And so we, we try to step out of the, all the details of the face guidelines that we've used to learn all of this and, and just reduce that to just a few key um, areas of business operations. And that deals mostly with wearing masks in businesses when you can't physical distance. And then whenever groups are gathered together at kind of a public gathering setting, because there's such a risk of a one-to-many spread, that everybody wears masks and we promote physical distancing unless there's uh, exceptions that the that grant is based on. And hopefully those exceptions are based on uh, an evaluation of maybe number one, the history of that business and being successful at safe operations. And number two, if they, ha- if they don't have a history of it, uh, what is their plan? You feel confident. Uh, does the decision maker feel confident in the organization's ability to execute that plan? So that's kind of a, a high level. The, the main levers, again, uh, are the main areas of this plan focus on mass wearing, social gatherings, public gatherings, and what to do in, in the business uh, setting as far as mass wearing goes and physical distancing. So that's uh, maybe just a, it's not all inclusive, but it's maybe just a higher level. So let's start. Let's start at the top here. The first question that came in from Melinda. There are case counts go to place of residency, not place of testing. Assuming many of the college students claim residency of state and searches have come from college towns, how can we really understand how many active cases we have in the state? Uh, Melinda, I will add that to our queue of questions to take to state. Okay, uh, Rich, we've got you back. Let's try again. How about now? Does this work? All right, there we go. Yeah, there we go. That. Yep, no problem. Fitting for 2020, right? Yeah. So let's good. so let's jump into the questions and, and hopefully you can stick around for a few extra minutes. I know your your schedule is tight. How do the new guidelines overlap with Utah Leads together and the guidelines that have been in place for the last few months? So the Utah Leads Together 5.0 was involved the introduction of the scoreboard, which basically outlined our strategic approach. And, and the tracking of certain metrics um, that are very broad uh, in, in terms of, of the statewide approach, everything from, uh, from uh, mitigative tactics on reducing case counts to ICU, uh, influencing ICU bed utilization and how we respond to outbreaks. It was more of a strategic plan on our, our response and the way that we measure success with that. That was Utah Leads Together 5.0, the most recent release. Since then, we've made this other adjustment in our, our, our broad approach to engagement of the general population and the retiring of the, of the guidelines that, and the phase, color-coded uh, guidelines that were, um, that were originally part of the Utah Leads Together. So I would imagine that Utah Leads Together 5.6 will bring these together, but this is just an emergency response uh, to... Uh, the situation in between versions. So that's how I would say that would relate. You mentioned this is an emergency response, the term I heard you use yesterday, and the governor has used as circuit breaker. So can you talk us through the timing of the response, why October 29th is an important date, and what the what it means if your county is high or moderate as of today through October 29th? Yeah, so the idea is that, you know what, it's nice to make this shift, and we believe it's a good approach. It's fundamentally sound, but in order to put increased dosage right up front to change the trajectory of where we're headed, we wanted to make an adjustment, and and it's basically the circuit breaker uh, analogy is that that's designed to, when there's a surge happening, 
it triggers something to stop damage. And what we're trying to do is state that, that for the next two weeks, we need not only uh, we need to enlist the extra help of those in the in the moderate phase to reduce their physical uh, their social gatherings and to also use masks the same as if they were in the high level. So the the circuit breaker concept is increased dosage right now in order to change the trajectory. And we feel like the two greatest levers, if we could get co cooperation from and participation from the general public, it would be that they literally change the way that they gather together to reduce that down to 10 or less in moderate or high and in public settings such as stores. And, and uh, you know, I always use the analogy of a store and a library just to illustrate those are kind of public settings um, or down the street when, when, when we can't physical distance, wear a mask in those settings for the next two weeks, even though you're in moderate and it's just strongly suggested normally in, in, in moderate. So we're using the social gathering size and the mask wearing as increased dosage for those in moderate to join those that are in high to, to curb the trajectory of this. And so those are the two tactics that we feel like would the, bring us the greatest return on the effort. If we can get engagement, that's what we're asking for is people to engage because without the engagement, we have nothing. Is it fair to say then, if you are in a county that is designated as moderate, that you, between now and October 29th, need to operate as if you are high? And then it's, the data will drive the, dis the decision after October 29th about the, the status of your county. That is, that is partially correct, although there are other areas of moderate that we are not asking to be treated in high. We would love it if people would, but the specific focus is in those two categories that I named. And if the data suggests at the end of the two-week period that, that you know, counties are continuing to increase and they will shift into high as well, then that's where they'll be for two, week, two weeks or more based on the data. Because remember, you can revert to higher um, transmission levels on a weekly basis, but you won't revert back until at least two weeks and then only when the data suggests it. And it's not a, a request to be lowered to a moderate from high or to low from moderate. It happens based on what the data is. There's just a two-week gate to go to a lesser and a one-week gate to go up. Um, that so hopefully it answers that. Yeah, and that that's a very important distinction. That the time frame is tighter if you are tightening the restrictions, but the the time frame if you're going to go down, if you're going to go from moderate to low, uh, you have a, a longer period of time. You have that two week, so it's one week to tighten, two weeks to loosen, and right. every. And every, that'll happen every Thursday going forward. And talk talk to us about what happens the day before on Wednesday, uh, what data you're looking at and who makes that decision and how do they notify local officials? Yeah, and we're still working through that right now. But uh, the, the idea is that 2 o'clock on Wednesday, the data will be available through the previous day. So the data that we'll be using is through that t Tuesday. So Thursday's announcement will, per will pertain to, to the end of day Tuesday's data. So Wednesday at 2 o'clock, there is a, a uh, council that will, will gather just to review the data to make sure that it's accurate. There's not anything that we're missing. For example, in counties where the, the case count is so low that we don't know how to trust the data, um, we, we would actually bring the local health authorities into the discussions to, so that we can see from boots on the ground does this data reflect reality? Because the data is too small for us to, to know what it really means. So we would have that interpretation of boots on the ground, and then uh, the decisions would be made based on that interpretation. But for the other counties where the, the data is thick and, and uh, very dependable, um, then we don't necessarily need as much input, although all counties, all county uh, health officers uh, pertaining to those counties that will be sh that, that are subject to shifting will be involved in those discussions. I will be in those meetings as well, and uh, we have a few others that come together 
and experienced it doing this for the past six months uh, with the other system. Um, so what will happen then is the decision will be made, will, the data will be confirmed, then we will produce a PDF report and push it out to uh, uh, the decision makers, county, county officials um, and public health officials in preparation for the, you know, an announcement on Thursdays that will go to the general public. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about the role then of cities in this process. Uh, one, it, it, can the city do additional restrictions or request a specific level for the, because of the transmission rate in the city rather than countywide? That's part A of my question. And part B will be what's the expectation around enforcement uh, either at a city or county level? So uh, cities and counties can do things uh, differently as long as they don't conflict with the public health order that uh, contains this system. Um, and, and that authority, I believe, comes from the local health uh, officer, uh, public health officer. But as long as it doesn't conflict, then they can make the adjustments. Um, and as far as enforcement, uh, we hope to not be in the game of enforcement or in the, in the mode of enforcement. There, they are, the, the issues that are under the public health order are enforceable. Uh, we're, what we're seeking really is, is our tone is persuasion and uh, inspiration for people to engage because it is a part of a very important and very good cause. In light of, in light of that, there, there are restrictions laid out around mask wearing and social gathering, but there are, there's a process for exceptions. Can you talk through the process for exceptions? The exceptions will be um, county by county. Uh, I don't know what they are. I did see an email from Salt Lake County that, uh, or I looked on their website, they have set up a process um, and, and it's on their Salt Lake County website. Um, I don't know what each county's process is, but they need to determine what that process is and then make it known to those that are seeking the exceptions. And the exception process applies to those organized events and other types of social gathering, correct? Yes, that is that. So let me just restate what you said, but I'll use slightly different words. The exceptions yeah. are sought when it comes to organizations wanting an exception to the physical distancing uh, policy in public gatherings. So, for example, if a theater can't function economically under the physical distancing guidelines, because it doesn't seat enough people to generate the revenue to keep the doors open, they can seek an exception from the county executives in consultation with the, with the uh, public health officer that they can seat every seat, for example, similar to what we had in yellow in the previous guidelines where all seats can be filled up to a certain capacity, side-by-side -side seating as long as masks are worn, Seats are assigned so that contact tracing can happen if there happens to be an outbreak and so forth. So that's not being required now. Um, masks are being required in those settings, but all the other protocols are, we're hopeful that the businesses are doing that because that's a good practice. And that if there's exceptions granted, that those types of principles would be employed in that exception and be expected. So by extension, if you are in a high transmission area and you have a limit of 10 people in social gathering but you you are going to require masks and masks and that's actually executed so it's not just on paper that you're requiring masks but you're but you have someone who's accountable to ensure that masks are being worn can you exceed that 10 person limit uh, so long as you have masks so long, long debates on that issue and uh, the, in the high category, the high transmission level, there is no provision to allow 10 to be exceeded based on mask wearing. We're simply focused on fewer people getting together, period. In moderate and low, 25 and 50, 
there is um, uh, uh, a, uh, an option uh, or a provision for increased numbers based on mask wearing. So that then leads to some of the interesting and unique situations that cities have because cities provide a lot of space that is accessible to the public, uh, some of which is indoors. So you may have a lobby of City Hall, you may have a city recreation center, uh, you have cities that are major employers. So can we, can we talk through the, the, defin the contemplated definition around public indoor settings uh, and what, what the contemplation is about what constitutes a public indoor setting? Yeah, so um, in the order, I don't have that in front of me. I, I'm trying to think where I have that, but uh, in the order, it spells that out with a little more specificity. Um, but, but the idea is it's, it's not a private residence. It's a, it's a place of business or a place of commerce. Um, it's a place where people come in um, the, the principle. And again, I, I, I could get the exact wording, but the idea behind it is that it's, it's a place where or an establishment or, or an organization that is not owned by the individual um, uh, such as a home resident um, or, the, or similar. Uh, I'll see if I can dig out that language here. Well, we're just about out of time, but I can get that language to you for further clarification. Perfect. Yep. We've had several people who've asked to see the exact order and so they can communicate it uh, to the general public. Um, so in addition to that, let me scan through the questions from last night because I know we're running short on time here. Can you can you, you you can you talk about what happens if there's a specific hotspot within a county? And let's use a a populated county like like um, Salt Lake County, where maybe the the or let's use a moderate county. So let's say Davis County currently moderate, but let's say there's a spike in one portion of of the county. Is it contemplated to be able to? subdivide and say this area of the county is going to be high or if you have the hot spot but it does the hot spot still doesn't drive the overall county numbers up the county would still stay in the moderate condition yeah so you know obviously you talked through that a lot um from a public health standpoint it's not uh easy to justify smaller and smaller jurisdictions because of the lack of the ability to control where people move in and out. There, people are very transient, moving in and out of, of uh, geographical areas on an hourly and daily basis. So we decided to uh, make this a county level as the smallest jurisdiction for the uh, uh, risk levels um, or the transmission levels. We, we, we may look and decide later that, that uh, we can actually go to a city level based on population uh, but we may not. I don't know. At this point, there's no plan to do that. Uh, we're, our plan right now is to stay with county and evaluate going forward. Perhaps there will be a time when we re readdress the size of the jurisdiction and, and look at going smaller. But for now, this is where we are. Perfect. So can you also address uh, the issues around schools or churches and other gatherings that happen in those settings? Yeah, so schools will fall under the, um, the, the same guidance that they have been. There, there is a, um, uh, a document that's, that's referred to as, let me get the exact name of that, it's the State Board of Education School Reopening Planning Handbook that, that schools uh, must follow as well as the guidance that's given, and, and it, this is recommendation, guidance that's given in the school manual. And whether decisions, uh, w whether a school stays uh, in-person learning or virtual learning uh, has to take place based on case counts, the three in a classroom, the 15 in a school, those are all items that are, that are outside of this order and that they take place between the local school officials and the local public health officials. And as far as um, uh, the religion, um, re religious organizations are exempt from 
from this order as it pertains to their gathering. They, have, they will function on their own and uh, implement their own guidance in their own congregations when they're on the, the, uh, uh, the, the religious organization's owned property. Perfect. Recognizing the time, can you just give us your, your two key takeaways around mask wearing and around social gathering and social distancing? When you say takeaways, what do you mean? What would be most helpful? I think helping people understand what they should communicate back to their constituents and back to their employees about mask wearing, recognizing that varies depending on your transmission level. But your, your key takeaways that you would like city leaders to communicate to the public around masks and around social gathering. So around masks, maybe if we could just inspire people to just wear them wherever they can. It's, uh, in, there, there are some requirements. We would expect that people would honor those requirements. We know that people consider masks as a political statement sometimes. We're asking that we just this and, and just uh, work cooperatively. Wear a mask when we're around other people of other households. It's, it's a very non-invasive approach to make a significant difference. It allows people to function in near normal capabilities. And it's very, very easy to do. Very inexpensive, very non-invasive, and it's temporary. So please just help us to inspire people to just wear the masks when in these situations where they can't physical distance. And as far as social gatherings, this is a tough one. I had a daughter come to me last night and talk about an event that she's going to this weekend that's, that's been organized. And th these guys are, are not planning to do, you know, a reduction of this, the size. However, they are planning to wear masks. And, you know, there's a lot of people that are against being told what to do. And that's our goal is not to tell people what to do. Our goal is to, to, to teach people correct principles so that they can make the right decisions knowing where we think they, they ought to be. And for this group to come together, and, and even though they're disregarding the, the, social, uh, the social gathering size, th they're at least making a step in wearing masks. They, they've kind of required that of their group. I don't know how big the group is. But here's the thing is, is one of the main uh, causes of our current status is these social gatherings. And what we're asking is that people will just make adjustments until the transmission rate goes down in their area, then they can have bigger and bigger uh, social gatherings. We don't want to destroy families and relationships, but we want to make sure that people understand that this is where the problem is. And if they can make adjustments, it will be helpful. Now we can have the best policy in place that we want. And if people don't change behavior, it is of no value and the trajectory of this situation does not look good. We need their help to make simple adjustments that cause the right outcome. Whatever they can do, however they can be helpful, be less argumentative, less divisive, and more cooperative in trying to help do something to make a difference in our situation. It only stands to help the entire community long term. It'll help to keep schools open. It'll help to keep you know, the K-12 and the higher ed. It'll protect commerce and, and the economy. It'll strengthen public uh, mental and emotional health. All of these things are long-term factors that if we don't realize are, are being influenced right now by our decisions, we're missing a very important perspective. We have to do the right thing here together. We may not all agree on everything that has to be done, but we can all do something. And we can at least all try to be kind and cooperative in how we go about navigating through this. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Director, for your time today and for all of the diligent work in recent days. I'll continue on the call to answer additional questions or at the very least gather the questions and I can follow up with, with you and your team to try to get the answers. But thank you very much for your time and your work this morning. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Perfect. Yep. Thank you, sir.
with that, for those who want to stay on the call, I will quickly look through the remaining questions. And if you have additional questions, feel free to post them or you can email us later. So going back up to the top, uh, Melinda, you had asked about the active cases in state. I will take that question to the higher ups about how they are addressing the, the place of residency. I don't have an answer to that one. Uh, next question from Wayne in Provo, our local mask ordinance has some except exemptions, kids under five health conditions, et cetera. Will the state have any guidance on exemptions to mask wearing counties with high transmission levels? The exemptions that the counties can offer will vary by county uh, and will primarily be focused on the social distancing exemptions, but I will follow up on, on that piece as well around local mask ordinance. You heard him reference the state law that passed in special session a few months ago about local ordinances not conflicting with state law. And so then the question would be, if you have a local ordinance, would what you just spelled out, would that conflict with state law or not? And so part of that is needing to get a hold of the order, which Isaac referenced to see the precise terms. So I'll follow up with uh, the governor's general counsel there. Uh, Lynn, you had asked, and I tried to bring that question up. Uh, Mayor Can, you had asked about the public indoor settings. Let me give the example that uh, in a meeting yesterday was used, which may help here, uh, even though Director Saunders didn't bring it up today. And so he used the example of a law firm, which would be like the private office in a city office, that if you're sitting in a law firm and you're working in your, in your space, you need not wear a mask. Whereas once you once you go into a city conference room for staff meeting, you do need to wear the mask. Now, that's different than, say, the office lobby that's open to the public, but, uh, but there you would want to have your social distancing requirements, and uh, the city would still, in the high transmission areas, require the mask there. But once you're, once you're in the, the work setting, these masks for your private works, your private workspace, or excuse me, no masks for your private workspace, but masks for staff meeting when you're gathering. Uh, Lynn, you asked about the exception on the churches, and he brought up the church piece. I saw somebody else asked what the what the rationale was behind churches having an exemption. I was not involved in any of the conversations with churches, but we can try to find that out. Uh, he mentioned the school piece, and if you go to coronavirus.utah.gov, you can see in the school district piece, and in a meeting I attended yesterday, an example, this example was given, which I think addresses, Dennis, your, your point on school districts, reference the fact that we've had high school football games with in-person attendees who arrive with masks, take the masks off, and then congregate. The recommendation yesterday in that meeting was that if that happens, that school leaders need to be willing to basically hold the football and stop the game until people comply. Now, we've seen that in a few high school football settings this fall, uh, but that was the recommendation yesterday. Mayor Sondak, uh, I don't know on the, on the ski resort piece, and so we can, we can try to find that, find that out for you. Uh, Greg and Jenna, both of your questions on the church's piece, unfortunately don't know, I haven't been involved in the conversation. Yes, Wayne, a version 5.6 is coming. Uh, we've heard rumblings for a little while that 5.6 was coming, but at least as of yesterday, there was not a date yet of when it would come out. Then, yes, so the rules announced this week uh, apply to everyone else. For individuals, they go into effect today. For businesses, they go into effect Sunday at midnight. Uh, Councilmember Thompson, a more aggressive plan to help people who contract COVID but can't distance due to housing size. That's come up quite a bit, particularly around uh, low-income houses and, and, and homes that have either large families or multi-generational families all living together. And so I don't have an answer for you, but that's been in multiple discussions about how to help those individuals, how to create spaces for, for them to quarantine and not, uh, not share the disease, uh, share the virus among the other people in their home. So, Doug Bitten, exceeding 10 people would do the local county health department require application. This is, this is a key point. Each county is going to have to create their own exception process. Uh, we went through this in detail yesterday. Uh, Jill Parker, who is my counterpart at the Association of Local Health Districts, 
is working with her health departments to get this process up and running. You heard the director reference that Salt Lake County is hard at work getting theirs up and running. So each each county will have an acceptance and exemption process, uh, and those will be live as soon as possible. So the any excess gathering above the higher the medium for which you would need the exception, you would need to go through your county. The county then would work with the local health department officer. There is no need for state approval of those exceptions. So it really is handled locally between the applicant and between the county with the in, with the uh, input of the local health department. So hopefully that answers that question too. And then Mayor Earnshaw, you mentioned high school sports and attending spectators. So at, at this point, it's still business as usual with the with the urging that that the high schools and and activities execute their plans. One of the frustrations that we've heard in recent meetings has been feeling like there has been a good plan on paper that's just not being executed. And the hope is, particularly during the circuit breaker time, that there'll be an emphasis on executing those plans to slow the transmission rate. The spike that we've seen over the last few weeks is actually the highest spike we've seen throughout the pandemic. And the concern is what happens when flu season arrives and what will the spike be if this becomes the new normal? Will there be an additional spike which will overwhelm hospital capacity and lead to more deaths? as we enter the winter season. So I am going to gather, oh, Scar, Scarlett, oh yes, organizational oversight. Thank you for bringing this one up too, because there was a lot of focus on this in the briefing call yesterday. So organizational oversight includes everything from a trained professional. Uh, so for example, the Dixie Center in St. George would provide organizational oversight to an event that's happening on the, um, at their venue. But organizational oversight could also include a city if you are if you are hosting an event and you have someone who is accountable and responsible to make sure that the guidelines around social distancing and masks are being followed. So the it's both the professional organizations um, as well as you know, a business or a city where there's someone who is who is accountable to make sure those are being followed. Can do city council meetings have the right to meet in person under the exception that uh, events with organizational oversight can be held? Uh, so yes, I would argue that you do. Also remember that during the summer, Representative Val Potter sponsored legislation at our request that gives the flexibility to you as a city to waive the anchor location requirement under the Open and Public Meetings Act and not rely on the governor's emergency order that waived the anchor requirement. So I'm, it's a slightly different answer, Ken, to your question, but let's say that in North Salt Lake, uh, you still feel like the, the data in your city warrants not meeting in person, and then you can waive that anchor location following the process that was spelled out in that legislation. Conversely, if you feel like that it is safe for your city council to meet in person, uh, then uh, I believe under these new guidelines, uh, you would be able to do so. Another piece that's related that came up in yesterday's briefing was a shift in perspective about working from home. Um, many businesses and cities have shifted overnight to work from home, the league included. And the recommendation that Director Saunders gave on the call yesterday was that if working from home is working for your organization, continue. Uh, but if you can do it in a safe way to have people work in person. You can be more nuanced and have individuals who are high risk or who are sick, uh, have them continue to work from home. But as long as you can meet the social distancing requirements and the mask requirements, uh, that it, would, it could be just as safe to have people uh, work in the office. Uh, so that was something that the Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce has been trying to seek guidance on around the, the work from home recommendations. With that, I think I have, at the very least, referenced every question, even if we were unable to answer them. So, Nick, my request is take these questions and save them, uh, including the person who asked them, so we can follow up. I'll wait another moment to see if any other questions arise. In that case, we will gather as much additional information as we can. We will have this link available on Friday Facts tomorrow. If you have additional questions that arise, please let us know and we will 
make sure to take them to either the health department, local health departments or state health department to get some guidance. So thank you all for joining us this morning and thank you for your leadership in our communities.